night. What hurricanes leave behind. Campaign finance and Facebook. And Apple's new iPhone plays hard to get. After a two and a half year investigation, the Justice Department has decided not to bring civil rights charges against the Baltimore officers involved in the 2015 arrest and in custody death of Freddie Gray. The six cops already walked away from charges brought by state prosecutors in May of that year, with three being acquitted and charges against the others dropped by the state attorney. Weeks of protests followed Gray's death from a severe spinal injury after his neck was broken in the back of a police transport wagon. The Trump administration is considering a proposal to drastically reduce the number of refugees allowed into the United States in the coming 2018 fiscal year. Multiple sources say the president hasn't yet made a final decision, but a refugee admissions program official with direct knowledge of the situation told Vice News it won't exceed 50,000 and could even be fewer. The lowest refugee cap record was 67,000 in 1986 under President Reagan. Iraq's parliament has rejected a plan to hold a referendum on establishing an independent Kurdish state in the country's north. Kurdish lawmakers walked out of the session before the vote, with one saying the decision wouldn't be recognized. Virtually every country in the Middle East opposes the referendum, and many in Iraq fear the vote would reignite conflict between the minority Kurdish population and Baghdad. Turkey announced today that it'll buy a Russian surface-to-air missile system known as the S-400 for close to $2.5 billion. It's the first time that Turkey has completed a major weapons purchase from Russia, but the longtime NATO member has been moving towards improved relations with Russia and away from its Western allies since 2015. Announcing the deal, President Recep Erdogan said that Turkey will make its own decisions about how to defend itself. Philippine lawmakers loyal to President Rodrigo Duterte have slashed the budget for the country's Commission on Human Rights to just 1,000 pesos, or about 20 American dollars. The commission has been investigating Duterte's war on drugs, which is responsible for more than 7,000 deaths, and critics view the near total defunding as retaliation for the commission's criticism of the president. With two hurricanes now out of the way, communities across the South are trying to recover. After Hurricane Harvey flooded swaths of Houston, residents are dealing with one of the storm's biggest hangovers, eight million cubic yards of debris. There's so much garbage piling up that neighboring cities are lending their own fleets to help collect it. Vice News spent a day with one driver from San Antonio's Solid Waste Management Department. We are in the park and ride that Houston let us use as a staging area. Everyone is conducting their pre-trips where we check all our vehicles and make sure that everything's gonna work safely for the day. And uh, we receive our instructions of where we're gonna go and pick up and then we head out and start our day. We are here in the Kingwood area. It's kind of an eerie feeling because you see these beautiful homes and they've all got open windows, you know, and some of the doors have been removed just like a ghost town. Basically, everything on the inside of the home is on the front yard of the house now. This truck is a grabbler that picks up debris. We throw it in the back of these trailers and then drivers will take it to the landfill. I take this load and come back and get another one. Yeah, no, it sounds good, man. And uh, dump that and come back and repeat the whole process five or six times a day. I've never experienced anything of this magnitude. As I'm picking up these items, uh, you're picking up people's memories. You're picking up family heirlooms, and they'll never get it back. 
I was able to save some pictures, but as I opened up a cedar chest, I found some postcards that my husband wrote to me when he was en route to Vietnam. I mean, these things are dated 1968. I was in the Army Nurse Corps, so this came from Okinawa. So I'm trying to salvage that. I can buy another couch, but where am I going to get another one of those? Just a memory. So seeing that, it's just, it's heartbreaking. It really is. I... <clears throat> we started about 10 hours ago. We started about 30 yards that way. And we ended up here. And that was four or five trucks full, 50 tons worth of rubbish. Six houses worth 50 tons. So you do the math. It's a lot. But we'll be back at it tomorrow bright and early. iPhone 8. This is a huge step forward for iPhone. Today, Apple announced the release of the best iPhone it's ever made for the 10th time. It's the best iPhone. They're the best phones. The best phone we've ever made. It's the best iPhone yet. The iPhone 10 is also the most expensive iPhone ever. So why, after introducing the most profitable electronics device of all time and selling one billion of them, is Apple introducing a high-end device now? Well, it might be because Apple is gonna sell too many iPhones. I'm guessing Apple would have a hard time getting 100 million OLED screens for production this year. There isn't as much production infrastructure for OLED screens. OLED, or OLED, stands for Organic Light Emitting Diodes. They are more efficient than LCD screens, which will save you battery life, and they're thinner. But OLED isn't a new technology. OLED screens are already in some higher-end Android phones. The rumors are that Samsung is going to be a primary supplier, and it's interesting because Samsung also uses OLED screens for its own phones. Now, if you want more, you might have to pay more per unit because they're probably producing them as fast as they can. So if Apple can't get enough OLED screens, it can't put them in the iPhone 8. So what can they do? Well, if you can't get 100 million screens and you can't put them across your whole product line, the natural thing to do is segment the market. Have a premium model that has the OLED screen, prices premium product high to modulate the demand. This is called product segmentation. Basically, it's making a different version of your product with a different price for a different group of customers. It goes all the way back to Alfred P. Sloan and General Motors in the 1920s who had the low-end car, high volume, and that was the Chevrolet and then he had the premium line, it was Cadillac. So Apple can add features like an OLED screen, Face ID, an emoji, and something called a neural engine to their iPhone 10, and when the time comes, trickle down the tech into their mainstream phones. Having the more expensive iPhone 10 also provides Apple with another interesting benefit. So there is a classic decision bias that humans have, which is to avoid extremes and look to the middle when they're not sure about which product is right for them. Psychologists call this type of decision-making a compromise effect, whereby consumers are averse to choosing an extreme option. Apple could try to put OLED screens in all their devices, but they're better off putting them first into the very high-end version and skimming off the demand from the Apple enthusiast by introducing a very high-end phone well above the price point of a fully loaded iPhone, they may be able to increase their sales by suddenly making it appear as a middle option, as a compromise option. That is iPhone 10.
past four months, Washington State Representative Melanie Stambaugh has been holding a series of marimba concerts to recoup $35,000 in legal fees and fines. A former state daffodil queen, she became the second youngest woman ever in the Washington State Legislature when she was elected in 2014 at the age of 24. And last winter, she ran into a very millennial political problem. So what happened? They're saying that I used uh, YouTube videos and Flickr photos in support of my campaign for re-election. In 2015 and 2016, Stamba embedded pictures and videos produced by the state of Washington on her personal Facebook page. That sounds pretty harmless, but she also posted information about campaign events. The Legislative Ethics Board said this meant she was using state resources to campaign for re-election. It's like the politics version of using a corporate card to impress a date on a fancy dinner. As a elected official, you can choose how you communicate with your constituents. I would just go to YouTube, highlight the URL, and put those on my Facebook page. The problem is that, according to the ethics board, while posting links to videos on a campaign page is fine, embedding the videos, as Stamba did, is not. But today, most social media sites now embed clips automatically. The ethics board is making a rule that isn't up to date with technology and doesn't fit current mediums that people use. Can you have prevented all this by having separate official and campaign Facebook pages? Regardless of having one social media page, two social media pages, it wouldn't matter. The state chose to put them to YouTube simply because they know YouTube videos are meant to share. And that's the absurdity of what the Legislative Ethics Board is doing. Because Stamba wouldn't sign a complaint admitting to an unspecified number of ethics violations, she was taken to the first public ethics board hearing in Washington state in 22 years. When a member has a campaign website and uses state facilities on that website, a violation has occurred. In the end, she was charged with 44 violations, with a potential price tag of $200,000. The board determined she acted unethically, but only fined her for one infraction. No one from the State Ethics Board would explain its ruling on the record. But their argument is easy to understand. Politicians can't use state resources to help their campaigns in any way. It would give an unfair advantage to incumbents in elections. We asked Mark Quiner, the director for the Center for Ethics and Government, about the principles behind it. You always want to separate what is taxpayer-funded or public money from private use or private monies. I often think of when a president is running for re-election and he, or and possibly she, is using, for instance, Air Force One, you know, they are expected to pay for that, even though they have to use it for security purposes, that must be paid for by their election campaigns. I think people usually think of this as like physical stuff. You can't send mail with postage paid for by the government. You can't, you know, use office supplies that are the government. How is this uh, shifted in the digital age? I, I don't think it has shifted, even though it may be a different nature now that it's so digital and we have ubiquitous social media everywhere. That does not mean that you're allowed to use public resources for that private benefit. But the distinction between public and private in the digital age can be convoluted. Some courts have ruled that politicians can't block constituents from their public Facebook page. The House floor is considered a government resource, which means legislators can't tweet from it, but they can tweet from the House gallery, 20 feet above. Hi, I'm Melanie Stambaugh. And, and videos produced by taxpayer dollars can't be used in re-election campaigns, even though campaigning can happen in taxpayer-funded parks. I think that there's a larger issue about controlling information. It is critical that I'm able to communicate with my constituents and they equally are able to communicate back. The cost is lack of information. The cost is silencing constituents. When Stamboff first ran for office, she didn't campaign on revamping the way the ethics board works. But her outrage over their decision and procedures has escalated the issue to become her number one priority for her constituents. And it's become a cause for her entire family, including her mom and sister, who all co-own a confidence coaching business and have spent hundreds of hours compiling information against the ethics board's ruling. She's working on her sixth piece of legislation to change board procedure and make licensing decisions in the state legislature more transparent. In politics, 
oftentimes you choose the issues you work on, this would be one that fell into my lap. These photos and videos are of legislative work, of work of um, me informing. Can I stop for a second? Yeah. Can I talk to you? I'm probably on camera. Yeah. I love everybody. <laughs> um, they're YouTube videos and Flickr mm -hmm. photos, period. This is a terrible injustice. It matters to every millennial. Do you guys understand? You're the, you're the future. If they're trying to push you out of politics or whatever's going on, I don't know the agenda. I, I don't have a fact for that. It's a big deal. I'm passionate about a big deal. You guys are going to do this. You're going to change this. Tonight is the third concert in her summer ethics series. So we're in the process of setting out the um, root beer floats. Tickets are forty-nine fifty for a show with marimba music and a mini confidence seminar. What is the injustice here is that I have to earn money to pay for something that I did not break a law. So tonight is all about, in the hard circumstances, using the power that you have of who you are, the heart you have in yourself, and the community you have around you to make the world for you and your community better. So thank you all so much for being part of it tonight. China has announced plans to halt sales of gas and diesel-powered cars as the country works to cap carbon emissions by the year 2030. The government said it's still working on a timeline to implement the ban. The decision echoes recent announcements by countries including France and the UK to get more fossil-fueled vehicles off the road. These are big moves aimed at counteracting climate change. But can individual people taking individual actions make just as big a dent? If we act fast enough, humans have the power to slow down and even stop the progress of climate change. There's broad consensus on that point. But where exactly does that power lie? Let's start with the individual. If you paid attention in grade school, you were told to recycle and compost. But a recent study calls bullshit on that. According to researchers at Lund University in Sweden, the actions that really lower a person's carbon footprint are things like giving up eating juicy steaks forever, giving up your car, even if it's a Tesla, and having fewer babies. Because according to the study, having one fewer child can prevent the release of about 60 metric tons of CO2 into our atmosphere each year, or around what 13 cars release on a yearly basis. But there's a hiccup. The study's findings may only be meaningful if everyone makes these changes. Here's what Sam Miller McDonald, the founder of Activist Lab, had to say about this. They call these individual actions, but they're really not. These are collective actions. They only work. They only put a dent in carbon emissions if millions of people do them. Um, and so then I, I think it, it brings up this question of, are millions of people realistically, realistically going to take these actions? And the answer is probably not. And there's another larger problem. When scientists compare the potential actions that humans can take, one thing becomes clear. In the fight against climate change, it really doesn't matter if you're a vegan bike rider who took a vow of celibacy. Because no matter what you do as an individual, governments are probably the only entities that really have the ability to reverse the course of climate change. The reason for that is corporations. 71% of all worldwide industrial greenhouse gas emissions released since 1988 were produced by just 100 companies. That amounts to 635 metric gigatons of CO2 released by companies like ExxonMobil, Shell, PetroChina, and Coal India. Because of this, voting for representatives who will impose regulations and who will make clean energy a priority, and then holding them to their promises, might be the most meaningful action a person can take. Of course, there's no harm in composting or reaching for that pack of condoms. More music. Maybe I love you. Maybe I want to. Maybe I need you. I loved it. I mean, her voice was was great. Um, when the beat drops, it, it got super strong. Like you can tell, like she can really sing. You got to bring the, f the feeling and the soul back to the music. People want music that they can feel. That's what music is about. It's supposed to evoke emotion. And right now, 
that song just makes me want to just really chill out like a motherfucker. So my cousin served his mama, shit made me vicious. Detroit public schools ain't even teaching the children. The ambulance taking too long to reach the victims. T Grizzly, definitely reality rap. You know, you can tell that, I mean, what he's rapping about, he's been through it, you know what I mean? He's gonna be a force to reckon with, I believe, because anybody that can speak truth and tell truth in a way that people can kind of understand, like, yeah, he for real and he ain't flexing, like, you can win like that. You got a fetish for my love. I don't know who it is, but that's some more of that Las Vegas dance floor, tongue kissing music. Who is it? It's Selena Gomez. Yep, yeah, I'm telling you. Four in the morning, anything goes. It was hard, it was hard. You know, the contrast between how light her throat was and the heaviness of the drums, like, it's like the beauty and the beat. <laughs> Isley Brothers and Santana. Damn. Yeah. What's, that's not Ron Isley, is it? Yeah. That's Ron Isley? Has he been smoking cigarettes or something? He must be fired up four blunts before he recorded that shit. Clap your hands. I ain't, God damn, Ron. He used to be light in the throat. Shit. That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, September 12th. 